610101. Revelation chapter 4, part 2. Jeffersonville, Indiana, USA. So glad to be in again this morning. I was just thinking of how that this snow, now, if we were in Colorado, this snow would be real soft and fluffy and be about 40 below zero. And you could feel blue like that and go plumb down to the dust. And it will be like all winter long. And now, but now as here in this off kind of a twist between zone, where it gets real wet and sloshy and bad and it just looks like I wish I could just fly away over in Arizona and wait till the spring come and then come back. That's how we all have coals, the germs and things now just lay on the ground and it'll freeze and then thaw and then freeze and then thaw. And that comes up as we breathe that in and it gets so throats, headaches and aches and pains and my, what a time, what a place. But there's a land beyond the river that they call the sweet forever. And we can only reach that shore by faith degree. One by one we gain that portal that to dwell with the immortal. Someday they'll bring those golden bells for you and me. That's where we go home to stay then, isn't it? That's the day we're looking for. Now, last night I certainly enjoyed those sermons and things that I had from my brethren. Where's Pat Tyler? Is he in this morning? Pat, oh, I didn't see you sitting right there. Big as life and twice as natural. And I didn't see you sitting there. First time I ever had Pat, had Pat speak. I certainly enjoyed that. I'm sure we all did. And then the little brother that gave uh, that fiery testimony of someone here that really did sound like a machine gun firing. Some brother, I met him from Ohio. Is he here this morning? Somewhere here, Brother Neville remarked about him being so rapidly firing. Then Brother J.T. Parnell, and I think they never did get to Brother Billa. And is he, Brother Parnell, here? Brother Parnell, Brother Billa, I'm not sure. I thought I'd seen Brother Billa. These lights, this is uh, the, when they build the new tabernacle, I hope that they fix the thing different, a little different. This is our first one, experimental. And so we ever get a new one, why we want it a little different from this, you can't see. I like for a tabernacle to be built kind of slanting down like this, the audience, you're looking right straight at your audience the, all the time. And then especially in the discernment meetings, you can just go right around, see, pick them right around like this, right back and forth. And then even if you have to have a small balcony to come out, it's better. Brother Littlefield, if Brother Bill is here, called me last night and he's sending the descriptions of that tabernacle I dedicated there, which the architects, by the wood, it cost, I believe, $500 just for the architect to draw it up. And he's sending that with the price and everything of all the material and every two by four and so and so that goes into it and he's sending it to us and wants us to come and say he'll go to the lumber people and so forth and see if he can get them to make a cut like they did on his very beautiful tabernacle not very big but it's very beautiful structure so i told him i said uh, i will give that to the trustees and deacons as soon as you send to billy and then we'll let them see what the appropriation of how much they have to have to start the building. He said, when you do, I'm coming, put on a pair of overalls and just the right with you during that time. But the little field is such a graceful man, gracious man, very fine. Now, are you all feeling right up to it to start the new year? Amen. Go right out in the new year. We want to start it the right off serving the Lord. How many got up this morning and thanked him for the old year and what all it meant and ask him forget all the back for so we did at the bedside when we got up and then come in to the table and where usually a little family altar they gather around the table and pray and so we always try to make it a habit of praying and a night before we go to bed i have that since i was first converted got up over morning and it's too dark and too misty for me to walk i don't know where i'm going but i I just ask him to take my hand and guide me through the day. Then I remember right across the street here when I was just a young man, Billy Paul was about three years old or four, and we lived just across the street, and one night he wanted a drink of water, and it was out in the kitchen, the dipper in the bucket, and I said, oh, I was so tired, I had worked hard all day and preached half the night, and he said, Daddy, I want a drink. And I said, Billy, just go right into the kitchen there, it's on the side little table. I said, 
He got up, rubbed his eyes and looked through there. He said, Daddy, I'm afraid to go, sing. And I said, well, it's all right. I said, just run on, honey, and get me a drink. Daddy's so tired, just a little distance about to the window. And he said, but I'm afraid to go, Daddy, sing. Well, I got up with a little fellow and reached over and got a hold of my hand. And it was a good thing. We hadn't walked four or five steps till he hit a rug where Mida had waxed the floor. And on a piece of uh, linoleum, and you know how that is, and he was just made a scoot. But I had his hand, and then he just squeezed that much hard tighter. And then I stood there a little bit, and I uh, thought, God, that's right. See, I don't want to make one more step without you hold my hand, because I don't know where I'm going to slide, you see. And as long as I can feel your big, powerful hand grip mine, I know you'll hold me up in the times of my sin. And so I try to make a habit of that, to keep my hand in his. And sometimes I've done things that seemed ridiculous in my own sight, such things that seem so unnatural to the human mind. But if we just let it alone, I find out it was the only thing that could be done to be right. You know, the things that don't look right here, if God leads you into them, they'll be right out here somewhere, you see, because he knows how to lead. So seeing that he is our all, sufficient grace and all that we have need of or care for is in him. Then let's lay aside aside everything else besides him and hold to God's unchanging hand. We used to sing a song here. I haven't heard it sung in a long time. Now I can't sing and there's uh, I don't think there's any strangers with us. So I that's the reason I try to hide uh, these little songs, you know, because I just love it. And Jean, if you let this go through that tape out in the public, used to sing a little song over here, time is filled with three transitions. Not of earth and move can stand. With your hopes on things eternal, hold to God's unchanging hand. How many ever heard the song? Oh, I love it, don't you? Let's try a verse of it. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's try a verse. When a journey is completed and together we have been true, fair and rich, your home and glory, your innocence also serve you. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes and things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's turn now. Just a minute for prayer. If you will, while we raise our hands to God and sing that again, hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes and things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Covenant watch. This was in riches that was have rapidly decayed. Build your hopes on things eternal, they will never pass away. Heavenly Father, as we stand, Lord, we just love to sing those old songs that go way deep into the inner parts of our heart and bring out the expression of our love to Thee, the living God. As And as we raised our hands, Lord, this morning, it was a little memorial that hold our hands, Lord, as I was telling about Billy Paul, how that he gripped onto my hand, he would have fell if it hadn't been, I was holding him. And oh God, how many times would we have fallen if you hadn't held our hand, thinking how that he, with no mother, as a little baby, and how that, how down through life that the roads that he had taken would have been killed long ago. But there was a great hand that would reach out where mine couldn't reach and take a hold. Now, we're so grateful for that. So I'm glad to know, Lord, that when we feel our soul separating from this body, that there's still a hand that we could reach out and take a hold of will guide us over the river. We thank thee for these things, this assurance, this blissful assurance that we have an anchor of the soul that keeps us steady while we're talking over this journey or sailing life's solemn main. And we pray, Father, that as the poet said, the forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing our steadiness or nil, seeing it shall take heart again or take courage again and try again Know that the all-sufficient God, if we stumble or fall, his great hand is there to help us. His grace is sufficient. Now we pray, God, that we will this morning start the new year off in hymns and singing and rejoicing and knowing that God will guide us down through life's journey and over the river of death into the promised land. Our eyes look beyond Jordan's swelling streams this morning to where the fields of clover and the fields of evergreen is growing and we pray God that our souls will catch that vision and never let it through someday when we have to come down to that stream where she crosses like that. Elijah of old, the robe of God will smite death's stream and will walk over without a fear. Grant it, Lord. Help us as we approach the word, O oh Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit will anoint this word 
we are insufficient to teach them not being a teacher. We know that the only way that we'll be able to know it is for that great master teacher to come and take his place of a ball in our hearts and of our power our minds in such a way and our thoughts still be all. He'll interpret the Holy Scriptures to us. We are solemnly depending on that. And think of it, God, oh, how wonderful that a living father like that, that was from, that's the very birth of eternity, that would come down to mortal beings and help us and would bring his word and give it in our mouths and hearts and ears that we might hear it and live to redeem us from a curse that we had nothing to do with it, Father, coming. Father, because it was done by the human race, and we are the offsprings of that first couple, and we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity, but just a living God knows that we had nothing to do with that, but has made a way of escape and gave us the privilege of coming. How glad we are we have come to the Father's house. We pray that that will bless our church here, Brother Neville, our gallant pastor, your humble servant. We pray for our deacons and our trustees that you will give them the greatest ear that they've ever had. Grant it, Lord. Give them a long life. Strengthen them, Lord. They are your servants. May they always stay gallant at the post of duty. Bless the lady, the members, your dear beloved children that comes to this house. God, we claim the soul of every one of them that crosses the threshold of this house. We claim it for you, Lord. Help us to be such ministers that will bring the word so plain and simple and so true by the Holy Spirit that will long to be like you. Lord, grant it. Heal the sick and afflicted that comes in and all around the world. Grant it in every house of God. Finally, when we are finished, Lord, may we enter into the portals, sit down at the welcome table of God and eat and live together through ceaseless ages. Until then, may we have health and strength, happiness, joy, power, and might and the blessings of the Holy Spirit to guide us we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, may be seated. I appreciate that fine musical this morning that I just got in, in time, talking to my good friend, Brother Skaggs, and Brother Jane back there, and another brother at the door, till I just got to hear part of it, but it was coming in on the recorder, very beautiful. How are you all enjoying the revelation? All right, I believe a whole lot, like my little girl, Sarah, back there, it's become revolutions to me. It's just revolutions going over and over, you know. I wish we just had now until about March or April just to put a great big canvas across the back there and come down in the daytime and draw out those pictures and the whole chart and just raise them up and down like window shades, you know. Like I've always dreamed some time of having a great big tabernacle somewhere where I could reach down and pull this chart down come all the way across the platform and revelations and interpretations the Lord has given me and take a pointer and start through there and bring these edges down. Then when we get through that, raise that one up, pull the other one down like this and start on that and teach it through. Oh, that should just be like a little heaven, wouldn't it? Just sit the complete winter through, just sit out with the Lord. So good to be alone with him, you know. We used to sing a song, there are times... I like to be all alone with Christ my Lord. I can tell him all my troubles all alone. See, that's the way we get to get. They used to sing, Roy Davis used to sing a little song, Still Away and Praise Jesus. Everything just points, everything you can do, can look at always falls right back in the line of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Now, on the church ages that we talked of last eight days in the meeting, then last night, I think we got into the second verse of the fourth chapter of the Revelation, and I suppose all of you were here last night to get it. And so I maybe if I get down on a verse or two of it this morning, and uh, or how far the Lord will lead, I don't know. I've got down to about the sixth or the seventh verse here. Just a little context wrote down where I can go back in the different parts of the Scriptures and pull out those things and where I studied yesterday. And now we find out, we left off last night, I believe, at the second verse, beginning on the third. I think it was, and we just left off with the voice of the trumpet. Wasn't that right? The sounding of the voice. Let me read it all so we can get back now. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as the voice of a trumpet talking to me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat on the throne, he that was, to look upon jasper and sudden stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the likeness of an emerald. Now this is beautiful, oh, beautiful lesson. And this morning, just before I was coming down, I got down here into the sixth verse. I thought, oh my, I can't get past that, because here is something in this sixth verse I want all the peoples to hear real well. 
when we get to this beast, this difference definition of this beast here, looking back into the original, one is a kind of a beast and the other four is beast is another. One is animals in the Greek, like wild animal. This other one is not translated in the King James for it isn't beasts, it's living creatures. And how those creatures, what they were, it wasn't human, neither was it angel. So it's living creatures and how they had four faces and four. Oh my, we bring that right down to the gospel and bring it right back again and placing it today just as perfect as it it here and remember four is an earthly number c and it's just a beautiful lesson there and so i'm pretty sure we won't get down into that maybe we will but it's so wonderful then the lord willing if we are around maybe the next sunday or may try that again try down see if you can finish up this fourth chapter before we get away we don't know exactly yet where the start will be now we find that after these things after meant that after the church ages had ceased, then John was summoned to come up higher, come up here, which means come up here. He showed him all that was going to happen in the world of the church age. Then after the church ages were over, we find then that John was a type of every true believer that will be summoned by Christ on high. That's right, summoned up, come up hither. And we find out that the voice that spoke to him was the voice of a trumpet, clear, distinctively, and it was the same voice that spoke to him here on earth. See, as long as he is in the midst of the seven golden candlestick, he was speaking to or from, or I like that, speaking from the candlestick. See, he was in the candlestick speaking from them to his church. And then when the church had ceased, he left the earth and moved up into the heavens. And he called his redeemed up with him. Oh, isn't he beautiful? Oh, it makes my heart jump. And remember, as we bring these things, I want especially young converts like Sister Aina here, or as Aina rather, and her husband, and Rodney, and his wife, and Charlie, and them to understand that these things, and many of you people that just come into the Lord, that hasn't went very far down the line yet just tasted him and see that he's good and gracious now notice this that these things that you're speaking what you're trying to do is settle your faith that when god says anything it's going to happen it just simply won't fail no matter it may look like a million miles and never can happen but god will move it right around and make it happen and he does that to test you look what he said to abraham take your son up here on the top of the hill and kill him after he had waited for him for 25 years. And he said, take him up there and kill him. And how's I'm going to make another, you are father of nations. And Abraham, 100 years old, his wife 90, and their child Abraham was about 115 then. So he said, how's it going to be? How can it be? If me, an old man, as old as I am, and waited for 25 years, he gave me the promise at 75. And here I'm 100. And Sarah was 65 and now she's 90 how after we've had this baby and you've told me way back there 25 years ago when i was 25 years old i was going to have the baby after living with sarah all these years i was sterile and she was unfertile so then how yet you made me fertile and made her fertile and then come along and give us this baby and you have raised him up here to 15 years old and through this child you said will bless the gentiles and every nation in the world and make me a father even of the gentiles make me a father then in the ages that is to come lord that should make me as a father of every nation under the heavens through this child and through this child they'd come a redeemer and through that redeemer would redeem the whole human race how are you going to do it lord that wasn't Abraham's thought. That wasn't Abraham's question. Obedience. Didn't say how you're going to do it. It's none of my business. You said it, so I know your words right. If you can keep your word for me and can show me that uh, when I was 75 years old, when you called me and said, separate yourself and journey into a strange land, I've been in this land for 25 years. I left an old man living with a wife that I've lived with since she was a girl. She's my half-sister. And then, all this time, and you give me this baby that you promised, I received him as one from the dead, and if you say kill him, you are able to raise him up from the dead again. Oh my, that's the way, that's it, and he did. And as soon as he was obeyed God in fullness, wrecked Sarah Isaac's hair from his face, pulled up 
the lands to kill his own son, his only begotten son, God was showing a pattern, showing us what did he do that for. He didn't have to, but he did it so that you and I, that we might look upon these things in this dark, dreadful day, where men's hearts are so filled with evil, that we might know that God keeps his promise. No matter how insufficient it seems to be, how impossible it might be, God still remains God, and he keeps every promise that he made. That's what I'm trying to say to you when we stand here in a healing service, stand here and say, I'm sick, and you, that's no doubt, you are sick, but God keeps his promise. Then he'll come down. Now see, he made an atonement here that he would heal you. That's what he done. Now, the only thing he asks you to do is believe that. Hold to it just like Abraham did. Well, the doctor says, I live one more day. I don't care. That's fine. That's all the man knows. That's the best that he knows. How was Abraham going to receive this child? After already laying him up here, and the word of God told him to go kill the boy. How is he going to do it? That's not the question. God said, do it. And that settles it. How am I going to get well? And the doctor says that I can't get well. I, uh, that's not me to question. I take God's word. And as soon as that's revealed to you that you're going to be well, then you just remember you're going to be well. There's nothing can keep you from it. That's right, sin. So when Abraham fully in obedience, how's he going to do it? The last moment, last five minutes come. The last three minutes, last two minutes, last one minute, last 30 seconds, last second come. When the hand was ready up to take the boy's life, God said, stop it right there. Stop it right there. See, I see that you really trust me. Now, I just done this Abraham to show that Branham Tabernacle in days to come, see, of what's going on, that they must trust me. They mustn't doubt me at all. Just trust me. Just about that time, he, he has a sacrifice. He never made it in vain. No, he never did it in vain. For just then a lamb bleated, a little ram had been hooked in the wilderness there by the horns. And how many times we went through that? How did that ram get there? How through them all wild animals, a hundred miles from civilization, amongst lions, jackals, wolves, every kind of wild animal back in there, way up on top of the mountain, where there's no water, no grass. What was he doing there? God created it and placed it there. And to sh see him in our days that we're living in, now this morning, I'm going to have to do a whole lot of personal things to say it, to get what I want to say. That's why I'm backing this the way I am. For starting on this, I want you to understand that these things that sounds personal, they are not meant personal. They are only brought in to give an example to you that your faith might rest solemnly in the faith that in Christ you might rest upon his promise, because God keeps his promise just as perfect as it can be. Now, showing to us and look at the same Jehovah Jireh, which Abraham called him, which in the Hebrew means God will provide for himself a sacrifice. God can do that. He made his way. If he said, he told Noah, you said, well, that was just Abraham. No, he told us all down through the age, and he's still telling. He said to Noah back there that as we are getting into this morning, why it's going to rain? Why there wasn't? Never was a cloud in the sky. The biggest stream of water was a branch where God irrigated the land, a little spring somewhere. That was the biggest stream of water there was. Now people say, how in the world is there going to come any water down from up there? Show me where it's up there in all that hot sun. If there ain't any up there, if God said build an ark, that it's coming. It's my business to build the ark and get it ready because it's coming. He's Jehovah Jireh. He can provide water up there. And the only thing he'd done was let man, foolish, silly man, do exactly the science to bring to pass that what he knowed would come. God never destroyed the world. Man destroys the world. God don't destroy nothing. God tries to preserve everything. Man destroys himself by his knowledge like he did in the Garden of Eden at the tree and so forth. And so some fanatic got a hold of some atomic power somewhere that they had it. They could work with it then because they could do things then with it that we have never learned yet. We are not that far advanced, maybe take three or four years yet or more, for we can do it to do what they did. They built the pyramids and the sphinx and so forth. We could never do that. We don't reproduce that. There is no way for us to do it. Only unless you can get an atomic power, gasoline power, electric power, wouldn't lift one of them boulders, wouldn't move it off the ground. And some of you 
them are block city high up in the air and weighing a billion tons how do they get them up there see they nude and they let that loose somebody let them one of them atomic bombs fly into the screen of some others back in the days cause as it was in the days of noah as it was that civilization that kind of a civilization that kind of a smart people as it was in the days of noah so it be so it be in the coming of the son of man a repeat of what it was see here not long ago they dug up a modern waterworks was down here in Mexico before the antediluvian flood. You seen it? It was in the paper where a modern waterworks was just like we have now that sank so far beneath the ground. Some atomic something covered it over. She just blew up and went over like that, see? Now, as it was in the days of Noah, smart men, smart men with atomic powers and everything could build pyramids and sphinx and so forth. And it was in that day, so will it be, but the works to be cut short in this day, cause there's to be a raptured people taken out, like Enoch. There's to be a people carried over. We are in that class this morning. The people that's carried over, like Noah was through the flood. But remember, before, don't forget this, before one drop of rain fell, before there was one thing in the sky, before Noah ever had there completed, Enoch was taken home. Enoch was raptured without death, just started walking one day and gravitation lost his hold on him. And he found one foot a little higher and the other foot a little higher and another foot a little higher. And the first thing you know, he said farewell, the world just walked out on up into glory. And when Noah looked around and couldn't find Enoch anywhere, he, knowed, he looked around and he didn't know where Enoch was. Then he said, it's time to get to build the ark now, seeing, and he went to work on the ark to carry over the remnant. There's, that's the same thing that takes place right here. The church was taken up into heaven, and John now is brought up with it as a type of the resurrected, as we took it last night, and find out that this same voice that summoned him to look back on earth was the same voice that summoned him to come up oh every christian the very voice charlie that summoned you one day down there in kentucky to, to turn around is the same voice that will summon you come up aren't you glad of that by the heavens their voice that said turn around the same voice said come up oh my there's what a summons what a reality clear distinct like a trumpet turn around serve me come up to where i am there we see him representing those who died. Moses was to represent the dead saints, Rose, Elijah, with, with his group at the last day, with his ruptured group standing there, all before the Lord Jesus. John revealed that Jesus told them that he would not die, and what was it to them if he would live until his sin is coming? And his disciples put a saying out, Oh, I wish I could get real, real deep right now, for a few minutes to the church everyone knows and everyone lives a private life with god it's an individual affair things of the spirit that carries you into places you would be darnest to ever even speak of it i've noticed this in my own little humble ministry that there's many times that i'll say something and not know why i said it and it don't look right but yet somebody will say something but i'll watch and that thing will come just as perfect around to that as it can come and god will make it happen when i just want to say something i'll say well now wait a minute that guy so and so this is to happen over here now that was just has to be in that way well really i don't know why i said it and the first thing you know is just that way god does it now when these disciples had said oh jesus said this man wouldn't die Jesus never said that. Jesus said, what is it to you if he lives till I come? But to see the disciples making a saying of it, then Jesus reached down and took John and brought him up and let him rehearse the whole thing to see the rehearsal of the coming of the Lord. John seen the church. He seen the end of the church age. He saw the end of the Jews. He saw the second coming. He saw all the order. And look what God had to do, boil him in grace for about 24 hours down there to let them see he was divine that the divine spirit had anointed the soulish that outside the soulish whatever you call it the human flesh 
had so divinely impressed it till hot burning grease for 24 hours didn't even scorch him trying to boil the holy spirit out of a man can't do that then put him out on the Isle of Patmos, and he wrote the book and come back and preached several years ham. Of course, now he had to pack a bad name. He was a fortune teller. He was a witch. How many knows that John was called a witch? Absolutely. Jesus was called one too. See, see, the world don't know nothing about these things. He was a mind reader. See, they said that he was a witch till he bewitched that Greece, that the Greece couldn't ban him because he had bewitched it, just because he didn't agree with the Catholic ideas, that was all. He was a servant of God that humble, had a little mission down there that he kept. He wouldn't tolerate with them big old things, and so God just kept him and preserved him. So did he, St. Martin and Arrhenius and all down through the age, and he's doing the same thing today, coming right on down now. Don't never forget this, that God promised great shakings and great mighty works now. Write this on your notes that you're writing, seeing that what man calls mighty and great, God calls foolish, and what man calls foolish, God calls great. Don't forget that, seeing, don't forget it. That'll help you along in the years to come because we're looking for something greater all the time, and we are receiving greater things all the time, but the peoples of the world don't know it. Neither did they know it in the days of Noah, neither did they know it in the days of John, in the days of Jesus, in the days of the apostles, in the days of Arrhenius. Any of those days, they never knew it. Even John of Arc, she was a saint little woman. When she was nothing but a girl, God spoke to her in visions, and an angel talked to her. You know what the Catholic Church said? She's a witch. And they put her on a stake and burned her to the death. The Catholic priest did, killed her, sentenced her death as a witch. And Joan of Arc died as a witch. About 200 years later, they found out that she wasn't a witch. She was a disciple of Christ. They did the same thing to all the saints. Jesus said, which one of your fathers didn't persecute? Which one of your prophets ever come that they didn't pursue? Said, you waited walls. Said, you go down and you put their garnish on top of the prophet's tombs and you're the very one that put them in there. Am um, I see? He didn't put any punches on them. Hum. He just told them, this generation of snakes. John said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Don't begin to say we have Abraham to your father. We belong to certain organizations. Are you a Christian? Oh, I'm a Methodist. I'm Presbyterian. I'm Pentecostal. That isn't in it at all. That has no more to do than that snow does with sunshine see it has nothing to do with it if you're a christian you are born again servant of god now when john came we had it last night now remember when you come to this for the context of the thing i told you then remember the world is getting the hardest shake it ever had right now the church world now remember no doubt in the days of john in the days of jesus there was great fe festivals and great speakers in their days great intellectual men and they drove tens of thousands times ten thousands of people what could caiaphas do if he called a meeting together he'd bring all jerusalem he'd bring all israel together from pillar to post and all of them say oh now if caiaphas says certain certain things that will be great oh do you believe the scriptures rabbi reverend dr bishop do you believe the scriptures? Certainly I believe the scriptures. I'm a noted scholar. All right. Now, the Bible said here that there will come a time that there will be all the mountains will skip little drums, all the leaves will clap their hands, and all the high places will be brought down and made low, and all the low places will be brought up and made high, and it will be done by the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Do you believe that, Rabbi Reverend, Dr. Pastor? Sure, I believe that. How will it happen? Oh, God will send a mighty man on earth someday. Oh, he'll be a great, he'll be a voice of the crying in the wilderness. Oh, he'll forerun the coming Messiah. And when he comes, there's no doubt in my mind that what he'll come down out of heaven and come down to the temple. He'll come right down here to the temple and say, now we're going to take all the Roman and beat them to death. That's all. We're going to beat all the Romans down. And then he's going to say, come on down, Messiah. And Messiah is going to come down and we are going to mold all of our pruning hooks into our swords and pressures and pruning hooks and there'll be no more wars oh aha uh -huh. that's the interpretation but what happened when it come what taken place there was no display of heaven what they ever seen there was none but they didn't see it 
they didn't see it see when did all the mountains keep the cliff crumbs when did all the high places come low and the low places high an old fuzzy faced preacher come walking out of the wilderness and didn't even know his abcs according to history he went in the wilderness at nine years old and never appeared again until he was 30. he lived off of locusts and wild honey locusts is grasshoppers them long grasshoppers they eat them all the time well you can buy them right here in there don't think that's bad cause you can't buy them right here in the supermarket if you want them bumblebees honeybees locusts rattlesnake whatever you want seeing so he lived off of locusts and all honey what a diet but he was kept by the power of god he didn't dress with his collar turn around as somebody said last night but the panel or some other of them he didn't dress with a frock tail coat and an all about it come out of the wilderness with a big old piece of sheepskin wrapped around him as i've said maybe we have to take a bath every day and perhaps he never took one every three or four months out there in the wilderness i don't know he wasn't very much to look at he didn't have no pulpit he didn't go into any big cities and have no big campaigns he stood out there on the banks of the jordan mud up to his knees and said you generation of vipers who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come hmm. that's when the high places was made low see and the low places was made high uh-huh yes sir then the first thing you know they was expecting the messiah to come down with angels and things and settle down on the canopies out there in the temple where they had built for him to come to like we are building these great places today they're across the nations and so forth see and when did he come he bypassed every one of them synagogues every one of them organizations and come down to a stable they forced him into it that's what it is today he's forced into things forced him to do it forced to be international because his message don't compare it with the denomination his message today preached by his ministers is interdenominational cause the denominationals cast him out the bible said so he was an outside knocking trying to get back in see in his own church that's what where it is at see it's just the same today so remember what looks big to man is little before god now that's the reason you don't have to have a lot of flowers and when god comes again when jesus comes again you'll be surprised that little washwoman back in the alley aham uh -huh, you'll be surprised that guy that don't say nothing keeping his secrets himself and walking around before god humble You'll be surprised, it'll surprise. I preached not long ago at the judgment, the surprises at the judgment. It wouldn't be a surprise to see the bottle lugger there. He knows he's going. Sure, I wouldn't be a surprise to see the liar, the adulterer, everything there. That ain't. But a surprise will be, and the disappointment will be those who think they were going. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then be turned down. Those who said, well, wait a minute, my mother belonged to this church, my father belonged to this church, my grandfather and grandmother, I have been a member there all my life. Depart from me, you work of iniquity, I didn't even know you. Look in the days when little old Simeon, a known man, no reputation, we know nothing about him in the Bible, but the Bible said it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost, here it is, there you are, that he did not die till he seen the Lord Christ. Then look at who was John the Baptist, some kind of a odd like fellow, a woodsman out in the woods. It was revealed to him. He came forth preaching the message. Look at that. Who was little Anna, the little virgin Mary, down in the city of Nazareth, mean as Jeffersonville, and where sin and everything abounded, but she had kept herself pure because she knew someday there was a Messiah coming. A coming Messiah seeing Joseph, a carpenter, had lost his wife and was courting this little girl. And it was through there the Holy Spirit came to that, and then the world comes around and blank names it, like Holy Roller, Pentecostal see, Black named it. Why? That she, that child was born out of holy wedlock, see? They believed that, and it looked like it was. But God does that to blind the eyes of the wise and prudent and reveal it to babes such as we learn. I hope there's enough background to when I hit something after a while, I'm going to show you, you see this oil? Now, what I've told you, the background to see that it isn't man, it's God. I'll point to this, all right? Now, come up hither, was a voice. And when he opened, he heard the trumpet. And then immediately, John was in the spirit, was in the spirit. 
and as quick as he got in the spirit, he began to see things. He began to see things when you get in the spirit. First, you got to get in the spirit. Is that right? Now, what if you went to a baseball game and you'd say, I sure love baseball. I'm harm. And you get to a front row seat right down in the box seat and you're watching the Yankees or Bulldogs, ever who they are, playing. And they're all having a big game out there. And your side is just about to lose. And all at once, the modern Babe Ruth winds up at the back like this and says, see, way over yonder, got three men on the base whammy. And he drives her plumb out of the sight, takes off his hat and finds himself, walks down the first base and looks around. All them guys go to second base, shake hands. The second baseman walk, walk quietly right back home, bow his why, my, the screams, the jumps, the horrors, the shouts of hoorays, why, they'd, it actually, I've actually seen them take these, you remember, the old straw, caddy hat, I think, I went to a baseball game one day and I see a guy hit a home run, and this guy sitting in front of me with a straw hat, he got all excited, took his hat and just put it right down, just put him in a collar around like this, where the top went out. Why? He was having him a big time. He was so beside himself, he didn't know what he was doing, just kicking and hurrying and hollering and jumping. Well, now you know what I think. He sure had, he was a, he loved baseball. He was a baseball friend, just like a cigarette friend or a whiskey friend. I'm a Jesus friend, yeah? I just love that. If you get to be a Jesus friend, you see a friend after something, then... Could you imagine that guy say, oh, sure, I'm a baseball fan, and he said about to lose, and they seen him come up and win the game like that. He looked around, and yeah, suppose that was all right. Uh-huh, say, he loves baseball, or he's something. You'd say, why? You don't like it, do you? There is uh, something wrong with you. Every good baseball fan would say, what's wrong with that guy? Something's wrong with him. Look at him sit there, huh? That's uh, just so. Put two to two together now, see. Oh, when you get a friend of Jesus and you feel the Holy Spirit sink in those words, then something screams out, oh, you get beyond yourself. I hope this man forgives me. He's sitting close here, the big, tall, black-headed fellow sitting here that was standing out there one night in the hall, and somebody said something kind of help, you know, kind of blessed him like that. And the old poor boy has a wonderful time. I mean, his wife left him and sued him for divorce because he loved the Lord Jesus. That's right. And somebody said something about Jesus. You know, he was kind of one of those friends. And he had been in the war and was all shot up and everything. The boy was felt sorry for him. Come home with his children and wife. Then he promised the Lord he'd serve him. And as soon as the Lord began to bless him and he got right with God, his wife just turned around, sued him for divorce and left him left him set out in the cold, but he still was a friend. And when he stood there one night and somebody was said something about Jesus, something, how great he was, like that, he said, oh, glory, shot his arms out, and here his feet was sticking through the wall like that. He didn't know he'd done it, had his feet stick in the wall. Said, why, Brother Bill, I'll pay for that. I think Brother Wood come down and put the place uh, on, put another piece on. We didn't mind that, Brother Ben. We just uh, we're glad to see you as a friend, see? When the Holy Spirit does something to you, you just can't sit still. There's something bubbles over. Amen. Whew. Yeah. Something takes a hold. You're a friend for Christ. When you love the Lord, just something in you, reaching out, grabbing, hungering, and thirsting. Jesus said, Blessed are they, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they that even thirst, whether you've got it or not. How many wants more of God, all right? Well, the reason that you want more of God, you're blessed just to be that. If you haven't got it, you're still blessed. And blessed are they that do hunger and thirst. You're blessed just to hunger and thirst because you want it. You're blessed because there's many people don't want it. Remember, my son on the other night, see, like the moron, he kept the box and threw the gift away, see? Don't take the box, take the gift, all right? Now, immediately in the spirit, and behold a throne set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. Now, little, a little later on, or we got it last night, I believe, that upon this throne that we find out, that first there was nothing on the throne. And was, there's someone on the throne, so it showed that Jesus had come with his church up into glory and was set on his own throne. 
sitting on the throne. That's after the church age. Now, we want to get to that after a while. Now, you say, well, where is his throne at today? Now, Brother Neville, if I pass over that, you ask me a while, where is his throne at today? I think I'll get to it down that far. Where is his throne at right if he's not on his throne now? He isn't on his throne now, no, sir. All right, now, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the likeness in the sight like unto an emerald. Now, let's take now the third of us to start. And so Jasper, this one that sat on the throne, was to look upon. In other words, when you looked at him, he was in such a splendor, such a beauty. Oh, I want to see him, don't you? One day, remember Sister Cuddle, Sister Howard Cuddle. I think many of you remember her. I was across the street there, and my wife sitting there now, remembering she was cold in the room. And I got up and had a little... It was a monkey stove out there. With, we baked our bread up in the oven, in the pipe, and it was real cold. The wind was blowing. Winter time, snow in the ground. And the wind down in the smokestack, and I couldn't get that thing to burn to save my life. And I was just so tore up about it, and I put some in. It'll blow out. Again, Bully was cold, and she was cold. I was trying to make a fire. And then I happened to turn on the radio a few minutes before, and just got warmed up, come on, and the cattle was singing. When I reached that land, on a far away strand, I want to see Jesus, don't you? Oh my. I just sat right down in the middle of the floor, and I just sat there and started crying, you know, how she could sing down out of that real sweet mocking bad voice of hers. You, I want to hear her when I cross over the border over yonder, said, I want to see Jesus, don't you? I thought, oh God, yes. I want to see him someday when the flowers are all floated by. I want to see Jesus, how to see him upon his throne, his beauty, his splendor. And if, oh, I want to stand where John did, so I can just stand and look at him. Here some time ago, down the slavery time, I say this in behalf of my colored friends that's here this morning. There was an old colored man and was going over to a little place and they used to, and used to do this down in Kentucky, have singing. Maybe Mama Cox and them can remember when they used to go and have singings, you know, go out to the houses and things like play an organ, the young folks and all sing, used to do it up there at Utica and around the country places. Now, they got a squat of whiskey out somewhere to a rock and roll party. But then they sang hymns, one of these old hymn singings, there was an old colored brother got saved and the Lord called him to preach. And the next day he went around telling the slaves in the plantation, he said, the Lord saved me last night and has called me to preach to my brethren. And finally he'd go back to the owner of the ranch or the owner of the plantation. He called him in, said, Sambo, I want you to come in here, I said, come up in my office. He said, yes, sir. Walked up to his office. He said, what's this I hear you scattering amongst the slaves, amongst the fellow out there? My hands, my slave, that the Lord made you free. Said, yes, sir. He said, boss, I'm your slave. He said, I was bought with your money. But he said, but the way that God made me free last night, Jesus made me free from a life of sin and shame and a life of death. He made me free. He said, Sambo, do you really mean that? He said, I mean it. He said, I heard them say that you was going to start preaching around here to your people on the plantations and things. Said, yes, sir said, that's what I aim to do, is preach this gospel to my people. Said, you really mean it? Sambo, he said, I, I really mean it. Said, come, go with me to the court. I'm going to give you your freedom. You're free from me, and you're free from any more slave. I bought you your mind, and I'm setting you free so you can preach the gospel to your people. He went down and signed the emancipation or the proclamation, and he was set free. He could no more be sold a slave. He was a free man to preach the gospel. He preached among his brethren for years. Many white people was converted under his ministry. One day the old fellow came down to die. He had preached for 30 or 40 years or more. And when he came down to die, he was laying in the room, and many of his white brethren had gathered around in the room, and they thought he was gone for about two or three hours. Then when he finally woke up and 
looked around in the room. He said, where was you, Sambo? He said, oh, is I back here again? Is I back again? They said, what's the matter, Sambo? Said, oh, I crossed over into the other land. They said, tell us about it. He said, well, I just came into his presence and said, when I stood there, he said, there was an angel, walked up, said, is your name Sambo so-and-so? He said, yes, yeah, sir, it is. He said, come in, walked inside, and I looked at him sitting there. He said, Sambo, come here now. After you have seen him, I want you come out here. We want to give you your robe. We want to give you your harp. We want to give you your crown. Sambo said, don't talk to me about no harps, crowns, and robes, said, but you have won a reward. We want to give you a reward. Said, don't talk to me about rewards. Said, just let me stand and look at him for a thousand years. That'll be my reward. I think that's about the way we all feel. Just let me stand and look at him. Oh, I'll have to have a different body than I got now. Every fiber of my being, just look at him. There John stood and he see him sitting on the throne and he was to look like Jasper and Sardin stone. Now all things and every word has a meaning. In the Bible, now, Jasper and Sardin stone, now if you notice, it compares with the rest of the scripture. In the back part of the scripture, he was Alpha, Omega, he was the beginning and the ending. He was the first and the last. He was Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He was all in all, was bundled in him. Matthew 17 shows that he, up in the Mount Transfiguration, it was all gathered in him. Now, Jasper was a stone and Sardin was a stone. Now, we'll get to the colors after a bit. Now, I want you to notice that each one of the patriarchs, when they were born, yeah, every person has a birthstone. Mine, I was born in April, diamond, and different months represents different stones. Well, the patriarchs was the same. Every time that a patriarch, when he was born, had a birthstone. And just to stop right here, just a moment, when them Hebrew mothers, let me show you a divine word, friend, so that your faith will be built around the word of God. Every time them Hebrew mothers, when they were in labor, giving labor pains to born, birth these children, the very words that she uttered in her birth, give the man, the baby, that was born of her, his name, and positionally placed him in Palestine, where he'll be at the coming of the Lord. The labor pains in his mother, like Ephraim was, by the sea, see? And Ephraim was given his lot by the sea. And Judah meant, I don't know what the word means, but I could pick it up out. Now see, that's where I don't have time, these short things to pick up those things up. But then go back and Judah, whatever Judah means, meant his positions placed among the children of Israel. And take uh, Genesis 48 and 49, you'll find out there that Jacob when he was dying, leaning on his staff, blinded, he positionally told those children where they would be at the end of the world. And they are positionally set right there now, since they have went back to the homeland, told Joseph, thou art a fruitful vine by the wall, see, by the well, with water. He went over, he said, you have trusted in the Lord God, you made your bow strong, United States, see, in the Lord, but some day that vine was coming back over the wall and there she is right there now just exactly what he said pretty nearly three thousand years ago turning right back to Ephraim he had dipped his feet in oil and Ephraim settled right there where the big oil wells are just exactly the utterance of those people what was on those mortals God taking their fibers and moving in them look like when the Roman Empire scattered them, when others scattered them, when they was hated by Hitler, tens of thousands times thousands, he shot bubbles in their veins and they died. You could see their bodies hanging on the fences with their babies and everything else and bones and took and made fertilizer out of their bone. Just take them out there and give them a shot and put them in the wagon, then get out time they ever get even to the start. They were singing, Messiah will come and will drink the blood of the grip again. When they went down, dying, them Jews walking right out there, knowing a few little more bits and their hearts will be gone. And down they'd go singing, we will see the Messiah soon. Oh my, 
making a fertilizer out of their bones. A lot of you soldiers in here know that and seen it. I stood in the grounds where they burned them and everything else there, Hitler and them, and look up at Stalin and Russia and all of them, done the same thing, that's right, but that Jew... What's the matter? He was forced back into his homeland. There's where they're standing. Now, I got that great film three minutes before midnight. When them Jews came in, they was asking them, said, Why are you coming back for? To die in the homeland, said, We have come to see the Messiah. Amen. Him. We are at the end time. Each one of those children, when they were born, they had a bathstone. And when Aaron, the high priest, over each one of those children had a bath. Breastplate on him, his dress, that's what I want to hold off just a little longer to get into this sixth verse because that brings in every symbol of the Old Testament right into there. Every, all the furniture and everything in the Old Testament was a pattern of that was seen in heaven, patterned back to the human being. And here's Aaron, breastplate, he was a high priest. Notice the bathstone of each tribe was represented in there. One, a bathstone, put his stone in there. The tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Benjamin, all was represented in here. And that's how then they take those bathstones, them pretty gems, and hang it on a post like this. And if a prophet prophesied, and if it sound right or not, they taken him down to this Uriah Thummim and let him tell his prophecy. If there's a sacred light that come on there and begin to flash these stones together, it was God speaking back. It was for the whole tribe, all of them, every tribe. Now, on these, the first stone, the first, how many knows who the first child was? What was his name? Reuben, all right. Who was the last one? Benjamin, that's right. The first stone. Of Reuben was Jasper, the bastard of Benjamin of Sardine. He was to look upon as Reuben and Benjamin, the first and the last. He that was, which is, and shall come, he was the Alpha A and the Omega alphabet, Omega Zing in the Greek alphabet. He was the first, the last. He was from Benjamin to Reuben, from Reuben to Benjamin. Oh my, there he was, look upon a sardine stone and a Jasper stone. He was sitting on this throne. How would you all like to see him sitting upon his glory? Let's turn over in Revelation 21, 10, right quick, and just take a look at him here, all right, 21, 10 to 11. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like jasper, as clear as crystal, her light, the light, who is the light? And the city has no need of the sun, because the Lamb is the light thereof. Jasper, Sardis stone, the glory of God, Jesus Christ, the glory of Jesus Christ is church. And he was the first. What was he? He was the beginning of time. He is the ending of time. He was the first of the patriarchs. He is the last of the patriarchs. He was a church that was in the spirit that was in the church of Ephesus. He is the spirit in the church of Laodicea. He is the first and last. A to Z, first, last that he that was and shall come, root and offspring of David, the morning star, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, oh, this 400 or something titles in the Bible pertains to him. Just think about it, what he was. And yet he was the lowly Lord Jesus that was born in a manger to the praises of God. Anything that's humble, watch it, cause it's right. That's right. Anything that's big is a stuffed shirt, so don't pay no attention to it. See, it's a lot of wind and not nothing to it. All right. Now, he was to look upon as Jasper and Sadi Stone. Let's turn back. Have you? We got a little time, haven't we? We got about 40 minutes yet. Let's notice. Let's turn back to Ezekiel 1. Go back in the Bible to the Old Testament and to Ezekiel. And let's read here where Ezekiel saw him too. And compare the scriptures now. And... See where we are at, Ezekiel, the first chapter, all right? Now let's read for a moment. Now I'm going to read the first five verses, and then we're going to read, and I've got it marked out here from 26 to 28, but let's read the first verses now of the first chapter of Ezekiel, the prophet, all right? And it came to pass in the 30th year, and in the fourth month, in the four, fifth day of the month, I was among the captives, among the captives by the river of 
Shabab. Is that right? Shabab. C-H-E-B-B-R. Shabab. And the heavens were open, and I saw a vision of God. And in, now watch, in the fifth day of the month, which is a month that King Jehoiakim came captive, the word of the Lord came expressingly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river of Shebar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Watch this prophet here, 595 years before the coming of Christ, so the vision compares with John. A whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire unfolding itself, and the brightness was about it, and out of the mist thereof was a color of amber, out of the mist of the fire. Also out of the mist thereof came the likeness of the four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a likeness of man. Notice the color of the Spirit of God, which was above the likeness of the four creatures, was amber. Amber is a yellowish green. Now watch. Yellowish green amber. Oh, he's the same yesterday. He revealed himself to Ezekiel in the midst of Ezekiel's vision. This light that he saw coming above the four living creatures was yellowish green. When he came to John, he appeared in the emerald, which is also the yellowish green. He comes now to the revelator in yellowish green. He comes to us in yellowish green, the light. Walk in the light. He is the light. Let's go to the 26th verse now so you can read the 28th verse. The 26th verse, and above the, oh, when I get home, I want you to mark that and read every bit of it, save time. And above the firmament that was over their heads was a likeness of stone, as the appearance of sudden stone, and the likeness of the throne was a likeness of the appearance of a man above it. That was the Son of Man, see, Christ. Now watch how he was, how he was arrayed there. And I saw the colors of amber, watch around this son of man, as the appearance of a fire around about it, within it, and about within it, from the appearance of his loins. Listen, be spiritual, be understanding, and in your own hearts here, I adjure you, in Jesus' name, keep this to yourself, but just remember how blissful eyes, let's start again in the 27th verse, listen everyone, be real understanding now, and I saw as the color of amber, that yellowish green, as the appearance of fire around about it, fire around the amberish green now, from the appearance of his loins even upward, from his loins upward, and from the appearance of his loins downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had the brightness around about fire all around, as the appearance of a bow, and in the color in the days of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness around about. This was the appearance and the likeness and the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Watch, are you ready? Listen, keep this now. Just remember to let you know, Jin, you can hold this tape. Listen, now I don't have to hold it there. That's all right. I mean, just keep the tape. I mean, this to the church. Notice this. Now, that you might know that the color of the light that's with the Lord, and the Lord's light that follows the Lord, and it's as the Lord is amber, yellowish green. That's the same color of the light that's with us today. As a scientist has took its picture, yellowish green, amber, when a little boy and I've seen it for my first time, you remember the old timers here? I always told you before the actual picture was taken, it was yellowish green, which is amber. Now, let uh, to you know that the scripture, It was yellowish green, which is amber. Now, to let you know that the Spirit of the Lord, he said, when he seen it from the loins on the living creature that stood in his presence, from his loins upward like was like a fire, a light from his loins downward, was covered with light, and all around was with many colors. 
like unto a rainbow. Is that right? I want you to remember God still exists in the same colors from the loins upward. Fire, amber color shot with a movie or camera with a light color camera, amber from the loins up, from the loins down and all around many colors like is in the rainbow in the sky after a rain. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever, the Holy Spirit, still in his power, still in his church, in his last days, there you are, not me. I was just standing there. It was a picture that was taken. I want you to look at that. That's exactly what Ezekiel saw, same colors, the same way, and acted the same way, and flashed the same thing of the living creatures. What was it? The living creatures represented the living church. The church that's living by the power and the resurrection of Christ them same amber colors has covered it from the loins upward from the loins downward there's no more guessing science has took the pictures look at their colors just look at the colors of the fire in there see the rainbow look at this yellowish green emerald color now on this camera it was just as street photographers camera on this camera was a color colored pictures kodachrome color look at the emerald colors in there if I could get it over a light somewhere where you could see it in the back, can you see now? Like unto a rainbow. Look at the streaks coming back and forth like the rainbow. Everyone a different color. We are going to get into that in a few minutes. What are those colors and what do they reflect? Oh, that just makes my poor heart jump for joy. And to know that in this day that we're living, that Christ, when all other grounds are seeking sons, all other ground, I think, why? Can't I tell that? Why can't I make the world see it? The world wasn't meant to see it. The world won't see it. They never will see it. But the church is receiving the mightiest shaking it ever had. In them days, they couldn't have took the picture of it. They can now because they got a mechanical door device. It's the ones that's trying to take the mechanics to deny God comes right back around and proves there's a God. That's right, Emerald. Now, you remember, I never made that up. I'm reading it out of the Bible. Watch as I read it and look. And behold, it was the same Lord God. There's no difference. Watch the 27th verse. And I saw the color of the amber as the appearance of fire. See, like a blaze is licking. See, amber colors coming from a fire. You see it now? Amber, this is the amber colors coming from a fire. Down here it says... And the appearance like a bow of a rainbow in the days after a rain, rainbow in the days after a rain, and there was a living creature. What John represented the entire church was taken up. I told you one person here in a vision can represent the entire body of Christ covered. Now watch. And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire about with it, and the appearance from the, from the appearance of his loins even upward. And from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. Watch. Look at the fire spring. Out of what? The rainbow, the seven colors. Now watch. There's exactly seven colors there. And the rainbow has seven colors. I saw as it were the appearance of fire. And it had the brightness around it, about. As the appearance of a bow. That was in the clouds in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around about, round about the throne of God. See, that was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, not that the Lord now, the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord covering over his church because he's in his church. Amen. Oh, it sounds foolish to the unwise, but how great it is to those who believe. Uh -huh. <clears throat> this was the appearance and likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice speak. Now he goes ahead and tells what the vision meant, which we have not had time to get into this morning. Now, notice how the Lord, in his great mercy, gave us these things. Now, let's take another one. Both Ezekiel and John saw him in the mystery of his colors and light, and call it an amber color. John later you that puts you are putting down the scriptures first john 1 5 to 7 john later and he was on the isle of patmos was about three years when he wrote the book when he came back an old man in his 90s in first john 1 5 and 7 he said god is 
late. John had an experience. He had seen him and he knew that he was late, late, eternal late, not cosmic light, not lamp light, electric light, sunlight, but eternal late. Oh, how I love him. God is light. Notice we're going to present, we're going to start back now and see where we are at on the third verse yet. Aren't we? Are we there? Are we going to get it? I hope. All right. He was to look upon as Jasper and side stone, and there was a rainbow about the throne in the sight like an emerald, yellowish green. Now, rainbow, you notice it was a rainbow. Let's go back in Genesis 9 and find out in Genesis 9 13, and we'll find back here the rainbow when a rainbow first appeared. Genesis, the ninth chapter, and we'll begin at the 13th verse. Genesis 9 13, all of you like this. Oh, I love it. I just. Uh, don't like it. I love it. Look, I do set my bow in the clouds and shall be for a token. What? Token of the covenant betwixt me and the earth. What? Betwixt me and Noah. No, betwixt me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is betwixt me and you. Now he come back to his covenant betwixt them but the rainbow covenant, see the covenant was life for Noah. He that he was spared him. But the covenant that was God made with himself was a rainbow that he would not. Now I'll show you what Noah's covenant was with God in a minute. But this here was God's own covenant with himself. Amen, a rainbow. Now we find out that a covenant then is a token. A token. God said it was a token here, didn't he? See, I set, I do set my bow in the clouds that after the destruction of the world, destroyed by water, all flesh besides Noah, Noah was destroyed, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, not me and the world. The world is a cosmos thing, but this is between me and the earth. God said, I made that earth, and I was so evilly treated in it that I just turned it upside down and flushed her to pieces, and I oughtn't to have done it. Maybe, he said, I was even sorry it was such a terrible thing. What do you think it will be when he comes in his anger now? Be right in a friend. Oh, be watching and waiting. That sight to behold. He's coming again. You believe that? He's coming again. I love that, don't you? Oh, would you be numbered as one of his four? I wouldn't want to be that. Would you? No, sir. Be a fool or be a fool for him. Be with him would be fine, but against him. Be spotless within be watching and waiting, that sight to behold, he's coming again, huh? Now, a covenant of a token of what? A token of what? Of a sacrifice that has been accepted. Now, get Genesis 8, 20 and 22. Now, Genesis 8, 20 and 22. All right. Right across the page it is, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savior, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again cast the ground, any more for man's sake, for the imagination of his heart is evil from his youth, neither will I smite any more every living thing liveth as I done. And now we can read the last verse, and while the earth remaineth sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. A covenant, same thing that John saw, Jesus God's accepted covenant surrounding the heavens and around about him was a rainbow, about the throne in the sight like an emerald, ambush green light around the throne. Praise be to God. Watch Noah, composed of primarily Noah's rainbow, composed primarily of seven colors. Anybody that knows the rainbow got seven colors. Now, what are the colors? Red, orange, violet, no red, orange, violet, green, blue, indigo, and violet that the colors of the rainbow now we got a deep thing here and i want just to uh going to have to hit the high spots of it because it's getting too late now remember orange or red orange yellow green blue indigo and violet now if you notice seven watch seven rainbows seven colors i mean seven color rainbow and that meant seven bows seven bows seven churches reflecting seven colors each light dropped into the other one it started off with a red red come after red come orange which is a reflection of red 
after orange was uh, come yellow, which is a uh, red and orange and mixed together. That makes yellow. Then green. Green is a uh, blue and blue and black. Then come indigo. And from indigo come violet, which is the part of blue. Hallelujah. Do you see it? God in the seven color rainbow, his covenant, that he made a covenant in through the seven church ages, the seven colors, he would save the earth. What would he do? Remember, he made it with the earth, his color. But now, watch, his rainbow only horizontally just covers in a bow, one half the earth. That was all Noah's rainbow covered, colored, just covered, just half the earth. It was a ark. That's all you can see. And when John saw him in his emerald color, he surrounded the whole throne of God. The half has never been told. He covered, he just the earth that makes an ark. Is just a half of it. That's the church ages. But when John saw him in his amber color, the amber color that surrounded and covered around like a halo, a halo of amber color, it surrounded his being, seeing one color, one God over all, through all and in all, but there is seven church ages. Watch, a great diamond. You used to find them. You can find them in Africa laying on the streets. You darest to keep one because it isn't cut. You got one that isn't cut. They'll penitentiary you for it right now and give you a lifetime sentence for keeping it. You've got to turn it as soon as you find it. Now, they take this diamond. Oh, it's so hard thing. I've seen one big 40 ton grinder standing up like this they pour that blue stone in there grind it around it mashes that rock into it just like ashes but it won't mash the diamond that 40 ton hanging on the swivel up there rolling around with them big cogs like that that just crushing that rock to pieces but a diamond will go right through it it will move that 40 ton casting oh when it crashes out and comes down through the sifter sifts down the other sifters washes down and then finally goes to a long runway the manager of that great Kimberly diamond mines was one of my ushers down here in the line real humble sweet brother and then for about three feet over that water where it flows it's a cosmo line put on there you know what it is you call this stuff the meter what is all we got in the journey cabinet in there bustling and we put that Vaseline about an inch deep way up here on the slide and it comes down and notice every time that that rock comes over it will roll right off of that Vaseline and when a diamond comes over it it will stick a diamond's dry and it will stick to that I've seen them pick them up even them little bitty ones and separate them with eyeglasses and I asked them what they was doing it for they said they sell them to america for victoria needles and things they won't wear out seeing but those big diamonds now there they are just one big ball but when they take them and take electrical machines and cut them and makes a cut diamond and when they cut it to reflect the fiery colors of the carnet and so it reflects seven colors also oh how that jesus oh you can imagine how a lot of money you might own the fleet of cadillacs you might be a pastor of some great big mob or cathedral or something you may be a bishop or archbishop or but oh brother when you find that jewel that diamond a man sells all his wealth his god gives it away everything else look at the sleeping virgin oh what did she do she had to sell something in order to buy her oil what did she have to sell her old creeds and dimensions and things she sold out all she had in order to find christ christ that great jewel jesus that body I had a ticket to go to heaven when the train comes by one of these dark mornings oh what blessing oh precious is that flow that makes me let us know no other fountain no nothing but the blood of jesus no popularity no big things no nothing no riches no nothing just give me the precious flow that's all nothing in my arms i bring simply to the cross i cling that great jewel what is it it was the perfect it was the age of 33 and a half years old when god put it through the big bumping machine when it took over there and began to shape it up he cut it he mashed it he bruised it he was wounded for transgressions bruised for iniquity the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we were healed what did god do to that perfect man 
there's only one of them in the world, only one in the world that was him. And God chiseled him off here that was sounded for our transgressions because I was a sinner. He let the rainbow light of his seven church ages flash upon me to know that he was wounded for my transgressions. There's your seven color rainbow. He was bruised for iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and his stripes you were healed. God cut him and bruised him and mashed him and cut him, and he may reflect through his dying wounds forgiveness of sin, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness. The seven spirits of God are the seven fruits of the Spirit that would reflect back in these people. He was bruised and formed that he, the light of God shining through that one man's body, might redeem the whole world. I'll be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. Watch those rainbow colors as reflect. But when John saw him here, what was it? The day of redeeming was over. It was all over. So he seen him original back in his original condition and amber color. Not only just half the world, it can only, the sun can only shine on half the world at a time, seeing as it goes around. But when John saw him, he was sitting to look upon as a jasper and sardine stone, amber colors, mix the two together. You got amber and an amber color around the throne. Oh my, I tell you, that just we could just go on and on, seven spirits, seven colors, seven church ages, seven ministers, seven lights, everything in a seven. God is perfect in seven. God worked six days, seventh day he rested. The world will exist six thousand years, and the seventh thousand is a millennium. Notice, in a half circle, halves not yet been known. Now surely these things represent something. Now in Exodus 23, 13 and Hebrews 6, 12, God made a covenant with himself and he swore by himself. Hebrews 13 tells us that, or 9 13, that he swore by himself. There was no greater that to swear by when told Abraham and Isaac. Now, there he had told Abraham that he would make a covenant with him, an everlasting covenant. God, a covenant is always made by an oath. So there's nobody, you can take an oath by somebody greater than you. Take an oath by your mother, take an oath by your nation, take an oath by something, by God. And you can't take an oath unless it's somebody greater than you. And there was nobody greater than God. So he took an oath himself, by himself, amen, swearing by God that he would confirm this covenant, amen, whew, oh, swear by it, he would preserve the seed of Abraham. What is the seed of Abraham to the Gentile, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? A seed of Abraham swore by himself, I'll raise them up, everyone up, I'll give them eternal life and place them back here on the earth. What we got to think about? He, so we see him in the circle of bow of green, amber, color, this greenish, what does green represent life? Green is evergreen, always stays green is life. What does it mean that God has promised as he took an oath back there in Genesis that he would know put the rainbow in the sky, that he would no more destroy this world by water. He also takes his oath and swears by himself that all the seed of Abraham he'll raise up. And this world will stand all of its shaken judgments, the judgments we're going through on the future lessons that we got coming, will show you where this world will belch and turn into volcanics and blow to pieces upside down and everything. But he swears by himself that he'll not destroy it. He'll smooth her off again and put his children on the earth for that millennium. Oh my, I'm watching for the coming of that glad millennial day when our blessed Lord shall come and cut his white team right away. Oh my heart is longing, crying for that day of sweet release when our Savior shall come back to earth again. Oh, how we are longing to see that day. He promised a great millennium would come. And another thing, the reason he was surrounded is a covenant keeping God. He will keep his covenant. Now, let's get the next verse anyhow. My, we want to get one more. And we got about, uh, just about 15, 10, 15 minutes to do it. Are you too tired? Do you want to go ahead? Commission says, amen. All right. Let's take the fifteen, the fourth verse. Now, and around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed with white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns, of gold. We may not get all the way through that verse. Well, let's start. The fourth verse, look now, when John saw him, that emerald color around him, he got all the colors, the rainbows, and so forth. And what 
it all was about. Now, on the fourth verse, first thing he speaks of here on the fourth, and around about the throne, watch. It's such a beautiful picture here. Don't miss it, the throne. You know, let's go back to Moses. Moses, we ain't got time to dig it up. So you just take what I'm saying, Moses, when he was given a vision up on Mount Sinai. I want you to notice that this was not a throne of grace no more. There, the blood had gone and the sacrifice was back again and they had been accepted and the blood was off of the mercy seat. And it was now a judgment seat because the thunders and lightnings issued off of it. Is that right? Remember, it was like Mount Sinai. When Moses went on Mount Sinai, what happened? Thunder, lightning. And even if a cow or a calf or a sheep or anyone even touched the mountain, he must die. The Bible said so great was a quake till even Moses feared it. And he said, take off your shoes here. You're on holy grounds. Joshua the great warrior was to take the children over and divide the inheritance. Could only come halfway up the mountain. Here stood Moses there with the colors of God flashes and lightnings and emeralds around him, watching them commandments be written. Standing in the presence of God, that voice speaking back out, Moses, where are you? Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. A judgment seat. It was now. Nothing could be stand there, but the redeemed sinner could not approach it at all. It's finished. The judgment seat, right? Now Moses made things on earth, made the tabernacle like the things that he saw in heaven. We know that, don't we? We find Paul did the same thing. Must have Hebrews 9.23 that Moses made things just like he did. And Paul, in his vision, when he went up into heaven, when he taught that great book of Hebrews, he must have saw in his vision the same thing that Moses saw because he said that he taught that wonderful book of Hebrews, how that Christianity was the antitype of the World Testament. He was a great teacher, Paul was now, and that was his throne. Then, then in the let's just, there's no use, I can't get, I was going to pass this up, but I can't do it. Where's the blackboard? Did you take it back? It's back, Doc. Well, maybe I can, you see it from here now. Get your pencils and paper for, I want to say something here. I was sitting this morning and something came to me. Now I'll tell you what I did. If you notice, I got it drawn on the back of here. See, just draw it out as the Spirit give it to me. See, draw it out on here of what it be. But I want to say something right here. Now, God, when he is enthroned, he is then judge. Is that right? When does a judge judge? When he comes to his judgment seat, a throne. Now I want you to watch the Old Testament was made, how the courts approaching his throne was made, and he, and John saw here, we won't get to it this morning, all of it, but how John saw the same courts of the approach to him, and what was the approach to his courts. Now, oh, I love this. Now in the Old Testament, there was what was called the congregation where the people gathered the first thing for the coming the congregation was to enter there that they had come under the shed blood outer courts now the first come to the waters of separation where the red heifer was killed and made the waters of separation that's a sinner who comes and listens at the word and that's how this great jewish rabbi was just brought to the lord had me preach on that down in atalsa atalsa it was we were there at Tulsa, oklahoma and he came over there, just a bystander, and he went after the service. He said, I know. Said he's one of the seven outstanding rabbis of the world. And he come over there, said, I want to see what them Christian businessmen, they call them Pentecostals, I want to go over, sit down, listen. And when the Lord had me speak on that red heifer sacrifice after the service, he met some of the brethren back there, said, I want to meet the man. I know that he isn't even got education, but he said, I'm a Jewish rabbi. Who knows all the different approaches and things like that? He said, I never seen that in all my life. He said, I've never seen it. And now he's a Pentecostal rabbi, filled with the Holy Ghost, going everywhere preaching the gospel. Pentecostal rabbi, he calls himself, he went over to the Washington Yuri Hotel the other day when we met together down at Brother Jack's and the lady knew him, said, Rabbi, she said, we got a nice room for you, but said, we haven't got, you know, television there. He said, them things are hell visions. Cast them out. Don't want them in there anyhow. It's in there. I made you throw it out. She said, Rabbi. He said, I'm a Pentecostal rabbi. Hallelujah. 
said, when you go to Israel, Brother Branham, I want to go with you, said, we can take it to our people. I said, not now, Rabbi, not now. Not now, not now, the hour yet. Wait a little bit. Now notice, these are the places, now when you come into the courts, the first was the outer courts, the next was the altar, then when the sacrifice was offered, the brazen altar, then outside of the brazen altar, there was a veil hung here that went to the holies of holies. In there was a mercy seat. In there was the cherubims. That's what I want to get in our next lesson. And those cherubims overshadowing the mercy seat. Oh my, I can just stay all month on it, see, on the cherubim. Now, notice as they entered in, the congregation could come there. The priest could stand here. But just the high priest could go in there once a year, taking the blood with him. And he had to be dressed in a certain way, a certain garment, had to have a bell and a pomegranate, one to one another. And when he walked, he had to walk a certain way. As he walked, he played holy, holy, holy unto the Lord, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Those bells and pomegranates ring together, holy, holy, holy. Why? He was approaching God, having the blood of the covenant in his hand, going before him, bearing the blood, anointed, oh my, with certain perfumes. His clothes had to be made with Holy Ghost filled hand. Registered hands makes his clothes. The rose of Sharon, the anointing oil poured in on his head. It ran down all his beard and then down over his place, the royal perfume, a pomegranate and a bell taking the blood of an innocent lamb. And he doesn't approach that veil outside. He'd die right there where he was standing. So he had to go walk in a certain way. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Approaching God unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. And he went there and offered the lamb on the mercy seat once a year. And while he was in there, he was privileged to see the Shekinah glory. When the pillar of fire, the amber light that came down, that led the children of Israel, he even smoked up the temple so no one could see it. The glory of the Lord fell till it was all smoked up and he came in himself, went in behind the veil and settled down on the mercy seat in the holiest of holies, the most holy place is called the holies of holies. And he had to be dressed a certain way, walk a certain way, anointed a certain way. He was a special person to go in there. How the congregation must have envied him. But when Jesus died, the temple will rent. Not only a high priest, but whosoever will can come, have the same anointing as the Shekinah glory, and walk a holy, holy life, holy unto the Lord, and approach it in the very presence of God through his blood of Jesus Christ before him. Take him with the Lord Jesus. Here lays a sick man. He's my brother. He's on the deathbed right now to die. I'm approaching you. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. What for? As for a priest, what for? On behalf of my brother. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. There you are. Your daily walk. Your daily talk, your daily behavior, your heart, your soul, and all holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. No roots of bitterness, no nothing else. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. As we begin to approach in behalf of our brother, whosoever will may come, anointed blood in front of him, the blood going before him, playing holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Now, that was the outer courts, the holy place, and the holiest of holies was that God's sanctuary on the earth. Watch, it was typed after that one of heaven. Now, we're going to come right back again to this same scripture. Oh, and all, as we go through Revelation, we come right straight across on back this again. See, now, he, John, where's John standing at the courts? Let's just read just a little further. So, here, you get the picture. And out of the throne proceed lightnings, thunders, voices, and there were seven lamps of fire. Wait till we get to that burning before the throne which was which are the seven spirits of god reflecting the light of god into the church right straight from the throne of god now god not through a seminary not through some bishop but from the throne of god by revelation of the power of his resurrection making him the same yesterday and forever them seven stars standing there reflecting that light the shekinah glory 
the light from the Shekinah glory from the holiest of holy, seven lamps on fire setting on top of those candlesticks reflecting his light, his colors, of his power, of his resurrection, right into the church. Amen. Hum. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and he goes ahead and he begins to give this beast the same thing Ezekiel saw them guards, one like a lion, one like an eagle. What was it? Now watch, when we bring them in and show that lion was the tribe of Judah and all those different ones out of their tribes that sat on four walls and they were guarding this mercy seat. Oh, what a picture. Oh, I just, there's great days ahead. As we see them now, that was God's throne in heaven. Moses patterned it on earth was God's throne because his judgment seat was represented here on earth in the Holy of Holy. God, all Israel, come to that place to find a mercy because God only met under the shed blood. Now, listen close. Then Shekinah glory raised from that mercy seat one day, and it settled on another tabernacle, amen, this one. The Father judges no man, but he committed all judgment to the Son. God's judgment seat for you. You speak evil against me, it will be forgiven you. Speak against one another, coming, another mercy seat. Speak, you speak against the Son of Man. I will forgive you, but someday the Holy Spirit will come to dwell in the hearts of people. One word against it will never be forgiven. It keeps getting more severe and more severe all the time. The judgment, because God is continually wearing his patience out, trying to get sinners to come to him to be reconciled. First, he was in the heavens above and shining through the stars. The second, he was on earth shining, the Shekinah glory. Next, he came and was made flesh and dwelt among us. God, wearing his patience, then he redeemed man by his blood, came into his church in the form of the Holy Ghost and speaks against. And then it's a finished thing, done. Now you can see where the shaking come, where the time I, they don't realize, people can't comprehend what it means. Now, the first throne was in heaven, judgment seat. The second throne was in Christ. The third throne is in man. Now, let me take this little thing that I got to draw here. You're going to make, I wish I had a blackboard that I could make it uh, maybe more sensible for you. You're going to take and draw the courts, only make it a round ring or like this, either one. Now we're going to take, I believe, like this, maybe, would we, the best, we're going to take and make the courts. Now, what is a man? He's a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. How many knows that? Watch God's approach. What is his heart? You remember my message. God chose a man's heart for his control tower. The devil chose his head for his control tower. See, he makes him see things, look through his eyes, but in it, God in his heart makes him believe things that he cannot see. Did he? See, God is in, on his heart. In the heart of man is the throne of God. You get it, man? God made his throne in the heart of man. Now watch. What's the first part of man? The first part of man is a body. The next part is his soul. What is the nature of his spirit that makes him what he is? He approaches now. Now the third part of the man is his spirit. And his spirit is in the center of his heart. And in the center of his heart is where God comes for the throne. You remember recently the papers given in Chicago about four years ago when the old believer, an old unbeliever rather, used to say that God made a mistake through Solomon when he asked when he said, as man thinketh in his heart, said, there's no mental faculties in the heart to think with. How could he think with his heart? He has to, he meant his head. If God would have meant his head, he would have said his head. Like Moses, what if Moses, God would have said, Moses, take off your shoes, you are on holy ground. He said, well, why don't I just take off my heart? That's just as good. He said the shoes. He didn't say heart. He said shoes. And when he said repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, he didn't mean Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He meant just what he said. When he said you must be born again, he didn't say you ought to be. 
He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. He never said, maybe they will. He says what he means and is God and he can't take back it back. He knows what's perfect, so he makes it that way. And that's the way he intends it to be. And you have come up to that. Not him come down to your idea. You've got to come up to his idea. That's the difference. Now, now on this system of body, soul. Now, if you get the word soul and look it up, it will tell you in the Bible, dictionary, Webster, any one of them is the nature of the spirit. Now, here's a man. We see, we see here's John Doe. All right. John Doe and here's Sam Doe. All right. Now, John Doe is a man, body. He's a brother to Sam Doe. Now, John is a spirit, soul, body. And Sam Doe is the same thing, body, soul, spirit. As he is, body, soul, spirit. Now, this man is evil, mean, cheat, steal, lie, commit adultery, any evil thing that he can do. But this man is full of love, peace, joy. They both got soul, body, spirit. Well, what's the difference? This man can go back and say, I remember my man. I remember things that we done when he was boys. Both of them can. They both got spirits. But they both got souls. They both got body. But the nature of this man's spirit is evil. The nature of this man's spirit is good, see? So the nature of the spirit is the soul of a man, see? So now God is trying to get into the heart, the spirit, and the heart of man, where the spirit lays, is in the heart. You know, and science has said, as I never finished that, that man couldn't think with his heart, and science begin to find out that there's a little compartment in the human heart, not an animal heart, but in the human heart, there's not even a blood cell, no nothing. They said it must be the place where the soul occupies or the spirit. Now, just let that them alone. They'll take their own silly things and prove God. Now, that's right. God just makes the foolish testify of him. Now, there it is. Big headlines in the paper. Brother Bose, little girl said, Brother Burnham, you know what you were saying the other day? Say, look, science has already found out said well bless god i want that sister i want that the soul of a man is the nature of the spirit and the spirit dwells in the heart of man now what is outer courts that's the flesh see that's the first thing you come to the flesh you've got to consume that first you got passed beyond the flesh i don't feel like getting up and going to church the roads are too slick it's too hot oh i don't know that's the flesh all right now you got to consume and walk through that. God has to get through that. The next time he come, he has come into the soul. That's the nature. Oh, what will these Joneses say about me? What my, you know, my church will kick me out if I do something like that, see? But you got to walk through that. And when you walk through that, then he goes into the heart and there's where he's thrown. That's the Holy Spirit in you. Jesus said it will be far better that a millstone was hanged at your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea than to even offend one of the little ones that believe in me. Not to do them any harm, just even to bring an offense to them. Just accept them about something. And it would be better that you had your own self drowned or never even been born in the earth than even to bring an offense to one. Did he mean it? Could he lie? Did he, the apostle say it? No, no, Jesus said it. Jesus said, if you even bring an offense to one of them, these little ones that believe in me, these signs shall follow them that believe. Some great uh, big fellow said, oh, I believe in him. Hallelujah. Have you ever spoke with tongues, interpret tongues, casting out devil's vision and so forth? As he promised? No, that's a day's past. He's not a believer. He's a make believer. Jesus said, in the last words, he said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Go into the world and to every creature, that's right, they shall follow the believer until I return. That's the last word that he said. How many know that? The Bible, Mark 16. Now, see, he is a make believer. But when you find a believer that really believes with signs following and you see the humility of their life, not in a personator, know that they are a Christian. A real, genuine article, just keep still. Thing you have to do is join right up with them, start moving along because you're moving right up the king's highway. Now, what happens? Watch this outer courts was Luther's age, 
as we start in the body of the Gentile church. You remember they were Jewish on up till about the time of the AD 606. When it came into their terror, it was nearly all Jewish converts. But after the Jewish, it dropped over in here both Jew and Gentile, but mostly Jewish. But when it really came into the Gentile age, come this side, see, come Martin Luther, John Wesley, and so forth, see. Now, watch these last three after that dark age. Come up to the middle age and pass over. When it comes, watch these outer courts, see. Flesh, soul, spirit, see. That outer court, the flesh, the holy place, Nazarene's pilgrim holiness, free Methodist, see. And then the holiest of holy, back into the Pentecostal, to where it began at the beginning, see. Back to the beginning. Now, if you're drawing it out, I want to mark now there's five gates that goes into the flesh, that controls the flesh. You know that, isn't there? That's five, the five senses. How many senses control the body? Five. See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. Is that right? That's the flesh, the outer cords. That's the things you can't depend on because it's flesh. The inner cords, then, we have the inner cords which is the next altar, and the next altar comes in and it comes with conscience, imaginations, memories, passions, and affections. That's the five senses that controls the inner courts. That's the soul, senses of affections. That's the soul, love, and so forth. And then the next is the sense in here. There would be also be memories and conscience and mercy and so forth and an imagination. You sit down and imagine things. What are you doing? You don't do it in your flesh. Your senses don't imagine it's your inner court inside of you. I've got three gates. What are we doing? We are breaking now. Don't miss it. Coming from the flesh, the five senses to the next, the soul, the inner courts. But now you come into the heart, see? Now there's where you pilgrim holiness and method is stayed on that altar out there. See, you are in the courts. You look around and so forth back in the flesh back there with the five senses what the eye can see and make out sin here's where the pilgrim holiness which was merely the free baptist methodist come to the next courts and believe in holiness because it was called the holy place where the sacrifice was laid but once a year went the high priest into the holiest of holies which was condemned there was the lutheran age then the methodist age then this age then the church lights coming which is like in the system of a human being. Then, how do we get into this? Now, remember, there was a veil, a veil that hangs between the holy and the holiest of holy. In the holiest of holies is where Christ comes to sit down at your heart's throne. Christ is enthroned here, comes through justification, is that right, sanctification, and then by water, by one church, by one creed, no, by one spirit, from here, we are all baptized into one body, which is the body of Christ, by the what? Holy Spirit. Who comes in? Free Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, whoever, whosoever will, that veil. You know what that veil is? That veils your heart from it. Are you ready? The veil is called self-will. Do you get the picture now? The senses out there, the senses on the body, and the senses to the soul, and the veil between that and the holy place, the holiest of holy. And the only way that you can get in there is to have self-will. For whosoever what, whosoever shakes hands, whosoever is immersed, whosoever joins his church, whosoever passes his letter, whosoever does know, whosoever will come beyond the veil. Let Christ come to the senses, say, well, I ought to, I don't want to go to hell. That's one thing. I'll join church. All right, Lutheran. Well, I'll tell you what I believe. I ought to live a different life. What I can. Sanctification at the altar. All right, Methodist. All right, then, whosoever will let him pass the riven veil, all oh, glory be to God. I'm on the other side. Hallelujah to his name. Oh, my, whosoever will let him tear down the curtains of his own will and let God come into his heart. There's Christ on his judgment seat. In the human heart, what is to happen? You say, I got to, oh, I can tell dirty jokes, you don't condemn me. Why? They ain't got nothing it can condemn. No one's there to take it out. No one's there to condemn you. Well, I'll tell you, the women say, I can have short hair. You don't condemn me. No wonder, seeing, oh, I can wear shorts. 
I can do this. The man said, it don't hurt me to smoke cigars and it don't hurt me to play some cards and shoot some dice and whatever they do, it don't hurt me. But they still belong to the church, see? Don't hurt me to do this. Why? Why? There's nothing there to judge you. But when Christ comes in, you have created an altar on your heart and your sins are taken daily. This great Saint Paul, he said, I die daily. Nevertheless, I die, but not me live. Christ liveth in me. There's an inner veil. Oh, brother, sister, hurry. I know. Oh, no. I just can't finish it. I'm past time. Let's see. Let me just uh, know. I better not see. I want to take the 24 elders, and I know I'm holding you all from your dinner. We'll just, let's see. How many C's take the 24 elders? Which one says a man? All right, just a minute. All right, just a minute. 24 elders. Then let's get them right quick now around the throne. And we are 20 around the throne. Now you see what the throne is at now in the heart. In the heart of who? The members of the seven church ages. Christ. Speak a word against the action you're condemned. You will answer for it in the day of judgment. And who will judge the earth? The saints will judge the earth. Who did Daniel see coming with ten thousands times ten thousands? The saints. The books were opened, sinners. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The sleeping virgin, oh my, can't they see that? The sleeping church, them that went out to meet the bridegroom, they let the oil go out of the lamp, never entered into this. Never let Christ take control of So he could work miracles and speak with tongues and do wonders and do things to prove that he lived in the church. What if Jesus would have come to earth and said, I'm Jesus, I'm the son of God, never done it, nothing. He'd just say, I'm going up here and join the church. Would that be the son of God? What did he say? If I don't do the works of my father, then don't believe me. Oh my, do you see? God declares himself. He loves to. He's Jehovah. He likes to make himself known. Oh, I'm so glad of it. Yes, sir. He's made known, himself known to me. I know he has to you. Some of you young people just converted. Yet you don't, might not know him in the power and great things that the older Christians do. But you're coming right on into it. You're coming right up the king's highway. Don't just keep looking and pressing just as hard as you can. Run, run, run. Just as hard as you can. Don't stop for nothing. Just keep going on. Little old Sister Snelling used to say, I'm running, running, running. I just got over running, running, running. I got, I just got over running, running, running. And you can just sit down, poor old soul. She's never over there today. All right now. And there were thrones and there was four and twenty seats. Now, how many would be four and twenty, twenty-four, right? Four and twenty seats, and upon the seat, upon the seat, I saw four and twenty elders, one on a seat clothed with white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, twenty and four elders, I want you to notice, they were not angelic angels, are not associated heavenly beings, are not associated with crowns and thrones. See, they never associated their angels, they never did overcome. If you notice, a little later on, the songs that they sang and things proved that they wasn't. See, they sang the songs of redemption. So, Angels don't need to be redeemed, see? All right. But they were redeemed men. I'm not you people. I ain't going to have time to catch this. But you, that's written down, if you want to know, they were redeemed men. Take Matthew 19.28, all right? 19.28, Matthew, Revelation 3.21. Then get those, Revelation 24, Revelation 2.10, 1 Peter 5.2 and 4, 2 Timothy 4.8. That'll let you know that they're redeemed. I want to get through this that this morning you see and you can just comb it for weeks, you see. They were not angelic beings, they were not heavenly beings, they were redeemed men, see. You can consider it dress, their dress the way they were dressed. You can consider their position, what they had, you consider the songs, what they sang, and know that they were not angelic beings, huh? I hate to come to this, but let's read one more scripture, will you? All right, let's go to back to Daniel 7. Just a moment back there, Daniel 7. Let's just read he scripture here. I want, uh, so this is going to help you a whole lot 
in the rest of the message this morning. I'm sure it will make you feel a lot better after you read this and see this. See what Daniel, the seventh chapter of Daniel 7. And let's begin now from this Daniel 7. Let's begin with the ninth chapter, the ninth verse. Now listen close to these things. Now beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garments was as wet as snow, and whose hairs of his head were like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame. You see again, come back to the emerald fire, and his wheels as burning fire, and a fairy theme issued and came forth from before him, thousands times thousands ministered unto him, and tens of thousands times tens thousands there comes your redeemed, stood before him, and judgment was set, and the books, plural, were opened. Now notice, this judgment was set, seeing, now what Daniel, when he saw the judgments, at the judgment they were empty. He seen thrones cast down, come down from heaven, the ancient of time came down from heaven. But when John saw it, the throne was already occupied by Jesus, and the thrones for the disciples and the patriarchs redeemed was already fulfilled, see, Daniel saw it 500 years before the time of Christ, and then after Christ makes 2500 years, and John was living over into the age that is to come, and he had done all this happen, but Daniel didn't see it, see, he just seen the ancient of time come, he saw him come, but when John saw him, the throne was filled, see, the thrones was cast down with the ancient of time, and judgment was set, but when John saw him, the elders had not yet chosen in the time of John, or the time of Daniel, but they was already redeemed at the end time. Oh my, isn't he wonderful? So Daniel 7, he, what Daniel did Daniel do? He foresaw the judgment, seeing the seated thrones was empty. See, they were supposed to be empty. As John in his time, after he, the rapture church, they were occupied by the redeemed elders, huh? What does an elder mean? If you take the word elder, I got about all these definitions wrote out here. I'm just keeping down. Elder means the head of a city or the head of a tribe, an elder, the head of something. Like I'd be Brother Neville's right now is an elder to this church. What is he? He's the head of his local body, see? And the mayor of the city will be an elder of the city. See, the elder of the cities, you remember back in the Bible times, the elders of the city, elder means the head of a city or the head of a tribe. Now, how many was there? 24 elders. Is that right? Now, oh my, who was it? The 12 apostles and 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 patriarchs. Now, we are going to take it right on down till we come into the other lessons and prove that to be right. So you, I'm glad you're writing it down, see? The 12 patriarchs and the 12 heads, tribes of Israel. Now what Jesus said that, Peter asked one day, said, what will we receive? We have left father, mother, husband, wife, children, everything else. We have left everything. Peter said, you have left our wives, you have left our children, you have left our father and our mother, our homes and our lands to follow you. He said, very, very, I say unto you that you will sit on the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes there you are, that's the redeemed, the redeemed elders. Now, look at David portraying Christ, see? When David was coming into power, the first thing he had an awful time before he got into power, yet he had the anointing on him, yeah? The anointing was on him. And yet a lot of people thought he was just a little renegade, a little guy that was different, trying to tear up something. But there's some men know that he was coming king, they stayed right with him. Brother, I mean, you couldn't get them away from him. As they walked on, one day he stood up, then the mountain looked down, I seen his uh, own little beloved city besieged by the enemy. And he stood there and remembered when he was a little boy, he used to take sheep out through there and drink that water. It was real water. We spoke of it here not long ago, the waters of life. And there he is, think, I drank of, out of that. And his least desire was a command to any man he had. Brother, two of those men grabbed their swords and fought through 15 miles of Philistines, chopping them from right to left to get him a drink of water out of that well. They knew he was coming in power. Yes, sir. One time, one of them to save him jumped into a pit and killed a lion single-handed. They were warriors. And when they, he came in power, you know what he done? He made each one of them a ruler over a certain city. See, Christ there, he that overcomes shall rule over a city. 
the overcomers today when we see that is coming in power christ will rule in this world germany and his states and all must fall every nation must fall the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of our god and of his christ and he ruled and reigned on them that's right we know he is coming in power at least of his desire is a command to us he wants me to represent him in a little bit it came back to where there ain't 50 cents of money where there ain't nothing or a poor bunch of people that's a desire amen you don't have to get so many you don't have to do this let me just know he wants to go amen that's all if he wants me to do different act different like uh, these sisters and things if he wants me to do a certain thing god bless it's a privilege for me to do it there you are we know he's coming in power no matter what the world says if i have to lay aside every weight and every sin that easily besets me let me run with patience the race that set before me let me look to the author and finisher of our faith the lord jesus christ yeah. coming in power that elders are the 20 and 4 elders all right 12 over in the revelation we find this in the book of revelation about the 21st chapter we find that the city of jerusalem had 12 foundations that's right and he had 12 gates that was three on each side three fours is 12 that's exactly the way the tabernacle set in the wilderness for john said exactly and so exactly the same thing that moses saw when he was up there same thing that paul saw and now we notice that the 12 foundations were names of the, of the apostles and the 12 gates had a name of each tribe on the gate how we look at that and see those 12 elders and 12 tribes the 12 apostles the 12 foundations the 12 gates oh my take them numbers of god and you can't miss it nowhere it should rain red smack straight everywhere every time that's the reason you see we got these six days that the world has labored in and we are way up close to the seventh day now the first 2000 years god destroyed the water the world with water second 2000 years christ come then in 1961 right at the door just a little time and look jesus said now it won't run all the way out he said cause i'll have to cut the work short if i don't the atomic bomb will destroy our flesh uh -huh. for the elect's sake i will cut the work short in righteousness cut it off part of the time see then the thousand years millennium the great day when while the church has labored against sin for six thousand years and the seventh thousand is a millennium like god made six thousand years to build the world and the seventh thousand he rested from all his works and the church labors against sin six thousand years and the seven thousands the church rests the white robes that was on the elders is the righteousness of the saints there white means righteousness and because they were robed showed they were priests or judges white robed priests judges prophets so forth see what they were they were white robed the 20 and four elders there will be 20 and four elders there will be 12 of them for the 12 tribes of israel the 12 apostles for the church they sat in the courts of the great king remember they are sitting out there these are and here is a bread of and christ sitting on the throne and his wife sitting by him the church the 20 and four elders the 120 44,000 eunuchs of the temple ministering to him where he gets up his wife goes with him oh my through that great age that's coming when all the sin and the resemblance of sins all the big fine buildings that people are so cherishing today all the money and lust and all the sin, sin and beautiful women and men and whatever they try to make their body something or the other to be a trap for the devil to send their souls into hell will perish and rot and skin worms will eat it up and the first thing the skin worms all that they ever was will just go into the a volcanic fire to return back to nothing but fall out and all the volcanic ash but one of these mornings friend one of these mornings when that is all over she'll bloom forth again the fields with his whitening clover and the fragrance of the rose will blend in with the blossom of the tree of life and christ will return some morning when the big birds the doves will sit in the trees and cool and there'll be no more death no more sorrow christ and his redeemed will return back to earth not old people but young forever immortal will stand in his likeness the sun and the stars will outshine 
I'm born for that city, that beautiful city the Lord has prepared for me, where the redeemed of the ages will see glory around the white throne. Sometimes I get homesick for heaven and the glory. I have to behold what a joy that will be when my Savior I see in the beautiful city of God. How oh, I long to see him. Oh, I want to see him. I'm born for that beautiful city. John saw it on the Isle of Patmos, coming down as a bride, adorned for her husband. The glory of it, I want to behold someday. I want to see him and look upon his face, there to sing forever with saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice, cares of past, whom at last ever to rejoice. The little slipping and sliding in the snow, the little height and toil of the day. I wish my wife and Mabel would come forth and sing that song for me. If I could, the toils of the road will seem nothing when I come to the end of the way. That's right, I remember the night when I left the church to start in the evangelistic work. When you all crying, none of them left hardly. Probably a few of you were here, sister and brother Spencer, and maybe a few of the old timers left when they cried and when the Holy Spirit said, you must go. And I remember my first meeting after I'd been gone for months. Mida, come down to Jonesboro. Becky was a little baby. Come down on the old cobble train. Take them days to get there. And I was standing out there and she was coming that night. We tried to get to the auditorium three blocks away. The policeman was holding the streets like that. The streets was even packed. Had to take me through the streets and wind around to get into the place. Mida said, did they come to hear you preach, Bill? I said, no. Then we sang they come from the east and west, they come from the land of far to feast with the king, to dine as a guest, how blessed his pilgrims are, beholding his hallowed face, a glow with light divine, blessed partakers of his grace as gems in his crowds to shine. O oh, Jesus is coming soon, our trials will then be over. Oh, what if our Lord, this moment shall come for those who are free from sin, or oh, then we shall bring you joy. Also, oh, deep is spare when our Lord in glory comes, we'll meet him up in the air. Amen. Oh, how I love him, only to bring you sorrow and deep distress, or oh, will to bring you joy when our Lord in glory comes, we'll meet him up in the air. With those thoughts on our mind, let's bow our heads. Lord willing, I'll finish this service some other time. Our Heavenly Father, oh, they'll come from the east and the west, they'll come from the lands of far. I'm thinking of that great rapture, the people I've preached to in Africa, India, and over the world, how I'll see their face again. Many of them crying, going out to the airplane and leaning across the fences and screaming and crying. I'm thinking of when they went out with Paul one time, knelt down, and they prayed. He said, I'm sure. None of you here will see my face no more, but they'll come from the east and the west. They'll come from the lands of far to feast with our king, to dine as his guest. How blessed these pilgrims are, beholding his hallowed face in the emerald glory, a glow with light divine, not just a lamplight or a candlelight, but divine light, a glow with light divine, blessed partakers of his grace as gems in his crown to shine. O oh God, when the call of fire touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said who would go for us, then he answered, here my send me. Oh, send the angel this morning, the cherubims, the six wings, as Isaiah saw them flying through the building, crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. And Isaiah, the young prophet, said, I'm unclean lips and among unclean people, and my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. The pillars moved from the temple, and the angel took the tongues off of the altar and got a coal of fire and laid it on the, his lips, said, I clean your lips now, prophesy, son of man. Send the angel this morning, Lord. Clean our lips from the, any vileness. Clean our hearts and come in, Lord. Break down all the self-will. Let my will in thee be thy will, Lord. Thy will in me, O God, and let me and my church and my people be thine, O Lord. We commit ourselves to thee. And as the poet went on to say, Father, millions now in sin and shame are dying over in Africa, down in India, around the world, thousands an hour and meeting with, with you without knowing you. Millions now in sin and shame are dying. Yet God, it tears my whole to pieces to think of it. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to their refuge. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. Grant it, Lord, grant it again. I've made all kinds of mistakes, Father, through this past year. I pray you forgive me. For them and in this new year, Lord, anoint me afresh. Let me go to those millions sitting yonder in sin and shame, are dying. Bring them this guest revelation of the truth. Bring them to the anointing of the Holy Spirit that on that day they might come from the east and the west, shining as gems in your crown. Help me, Lord, to go down and prospect and dig them out of the ground and 
the dirt on the earth and the dirt on the fields that you're living in and let them see a holy God that makes them clean up and live like Christians, sanctified and pure before you, turning away from evil, from all kinds of worldly amusements and turning to a living God and making them delegates of the kingdom for that great day. Sanctify this little church this morning, Lord. Sanctify every person in here with the Spirit and let the Holy Ghost come into their hearts, each one of us, freshen up their saint, their spirit in them who's already opened their hearts through their self-will, has denied their own will and has come to your, know your will. Those young ones, Lord, many of them just little babies, how you nurse them in your arms, how a mother takes care of a little one, wiping the tears from their eyes and giving them special things because she loves them. That's how love your little born babies, Lord. They can't walk yet. They can't talk, can't even talk. Only they can do is cry and look for mama. Oh God, hold them in your arms tenderly like little lambs and lead them until they become nature, until they can walk. Then lead them, Lord, down through the path of service granted. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For then is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And through Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you. I trust that the Lord has done something for you this morning to make you a start the new year upon this one thing that you love Jesus Christ and someday you want to see him and love him and live with him forever. It's my desire that not one of you will be lost and every one of you will come and be filled with the Holy Spirit and be preserved unto the day of his coming because I believe it's not at hand. Now I'll turn the service back to Brother Neville.